So uh, my presentation is on uh, a, a rack middleware that I've been working on, and uh, I'll be using uh, some of the stuff over here. I'll be talking about like, I'll uh, be talking about some of the stuff over here. So my name is Calvin. I work at Scout Mob, and that's just the. All right. So. Um, as a as a consumer uh, a consumer facing site one the, pro the, the our problems that we uh, focus on a lot is SEO, and uh, recently we've been uh, looking working on fixing our 404 problem, and uh, if any mature consumer site over time you're going to start collecting 404 is natural when you, you know you'll do things like refactoring uh, existing routes uh, to optimize SEO, and then also. Um, you know and then taking taking pay, taking uh, out old pages or. Or even somebody giving wrong links to to people to to share on Twitter. So uh, over time, you sort of you sort of your list your number of 404 starts to go up. And as you can see, we've been now uh, working on lowering that. Um, and usually, the the way we've traditionally fixed this is uh, in two ways. We have a, a rewrite. We have a whole list of rewrites on Nginx, which is, this is actually our production uh, Nginx file, which is sort of nasty. So here's one where somebody shared a wrong contest link. Um, and then the other way we do it is through, through a Rails file. These are more complex redirects, and fortunately in Rails, uh, Rails 3, they provide some nice little, uh, uh, nice little redirect instruction. That Actually, that class, redirect with query strings, is actually custom. Um, but uh, yeah, you can actually do that from a Rails file as well. But uh, so, when, um, so when we wanted to start to tackle this 404 problem, we wanted, we want to try to solve this in a different way. And, and the reason being that you don't really want redirects in your routes file, or you don't want redirects in your Nginx file. They just, you want to keep it as clean as possible. And all these, the one-off redirects, you just want to, you want to try to ex externalize somewhere else. So um, I didn't really see a good solution for that online, so I decided to develop something called, rack, what I call Rack Switchboard. So basically, um, Switchboard is basically a Rack middleware. And um, and uh, and which is actually interesting that uh, Richard was talking about Rack because uh, Rack is basically the the underlying layer that all frameworks communicate to the web servers with. So the beauty of having a Rack creating a Rack middleware is that if you if the middleware is developed well, you can basically support any framework out there. So this this middleware can actually work for. Sinatra or, or Rails. So, and what it does basically is it basically listens, it basically wraps around an app, and if it sees a 404, it looks up, uh, looks up uh, rewrite rules from uh, external, ex external storage, and then runs, any, runs the appropriate rewrite. So it's basically like a model rewrite stored in the database, if you guys are familiar with that. And uh, this is how it's. Uh, this is how you would configure it. This is a, a very simple rack app. And uh, so this is a rack up file. You basically import switchboard, and then you basically. And so uh, switchboard, I developed it with two different stores: a memory store just for testing and development, and then I wrote a, a Redis store because this, that's actually the the name uh, key value pair storage that we use. So um, I, I. So it's very simple. Uh, this is a very simple rack app. This is. You know, this is actually how, this is the very uh, primitive way, the most primitive uh, form of a rack app you can come up with. So basically what happens is that if, if the path uh, of the app is hello, it returns hello rack. And anything else, it returns 404, just so I can test the redirects. And this is actually uh, the, the core part of this, the, the actual middleware code. Uh, and then you can see that at the very top, the middleware calls the internal app, which in, if you're using Rails, that's the Rails app. If you're using Sinatra, that's the Sinatra app. And it gets the result. And the rack result has, is an array with three elements, the first element being the status, second being the headers, and then the last being the response. So basically, I look at the first, I look at the first result, and, and, see, and if it's a 404, I, uh, I create a store, and basically stores the abstraction over you know, whatever, st whatever store we want to use for storing our rewrite rules. And then based on that, it'll, it'll, uh, create, it'll create a rewrite. And this is actually the beauty of Rack. The interface is so simple. What I was able to use is use a, a Rack rewrite middleware. And basically, I'm creating it dynamically, passing it, 
the store. The internals are a little bit convoluted because configuring that configuring the, the rack rewrite jam, the rack rewrite middleware is a little bit tricky. But um, so basically that creates a, actually an internal middleware and calls and calls it with the existing environment and sees if there's a rewrite for that 404. And if there's a rewrite for that 404, it'll, it'll use the, it'll use the, re, uh, the, it'll return that rewrite. Otherwise, it'll, um, it'll return the original uh, 404 result of the app. So, and the reason why we do that is because usually your apps will have a better design 404 than my middleware. I didn't want to really write, go overboard with being able to configure your 404 style. Um, couple of things. Now, another nice thing is that uh, since we're only ch we, we only do this processing if we do a 404, we don't hit we don't unnecessarily hit like like a Redis server. Although Redis is fast, you basically save a, a network round trip just to get just to get the rewrite rules. And uh, and then one more thing I found out when we actually deployed this in production was that if you're um, if you're not going to use the the, re the return response from the app, make sure you call close. Try to call close on the uh, on the on the on the response on the response body, which is line twenty three, I think. And because uh, the rack lock middleware actually will ha sets up a mutex and cl and clears out that uh, that mutex for uh, on on body close, and this is the handle like single processing with Rails. So that's that. So another side of the the switchboard is that we actually create an admin. Because I mean, just being able to do these redirects is, you know, it's, it's, it's a pretty simple app. I wanted to go one step further and create an admin that actually allows you to manage these rewrites. And uh, actually, this is a, a single page, a single page uh, web application. Actually, is written in uh, using Angular JS and Bootstrap. Now, the beauty of this is that actually it's one HTML page, and I've actually uh, included. Uh, Bootstrap CDN and also uh, Angular from CDN. So, I'd, so all, everything everything is all encapsulated in one HTML page, and um, and actually, and so basically that is an actual a actual rack app and not a middleware. And this is how you would configure it. Um, and basically, all all that ad admin is is. It basically provides uh, has two uh, end, API endpoints for managing rewrites and something else I'll talk about later, and then uh, also it, it serves up the one HTML file. And yeah, so and then the other thing that the other API is for managing 404s. Well, one of the, the the beauty of you know listening to the parent app and catching 404s is that you can actually record them. Uh, as they come in, so you can actually over time see where people are getting tripped up on your 404s and easily add routes to them, and so that's what that does. That basically store uh, store uh, 404s and their paths into a bounded list to manage to keep track of all the 404s. So you can actually look at like existing 404s, and uh, you can either remove you can either remove them, which I'll uh, create later if you get another 404, or you can actually create rewrite rules with a plus sign over there. So, and so that's basically it. And that's basically the beauty of, uh, of Rack is that you don't have to build, you don't have to do a lot to build something very useful. It's, uh, the interface is extremely simple. And uh, I think what I want to do is probably show what it looks like. It's very, I mean, it's super simple. So this is the main route. And then so say, I think actually there's a re oh. and although that's weird. There we go, there's that. There's that route. I can't scroll. Yeah. So Here, there you go. It's, as you can see, it's pretty fast. It's there's not much going on there. And then uh, one thing I want to show you was basically the index HTML. I mean, this is the first time I've using uh, I've used Angular JS, and um, I've used I've used Backbone before. I've used uh, Spine before, and uh, and it's, 
and uh, Ember before when it was Sprout Core. And I, what's nice about what's nice about Angular JS is so super lightweight, and and uh, it's actually whether it's good or bad. It's it's one of the things that it's interesting about is that it's actually um, declarative. So you basically you declare you bind controllers to um, bind controllers to divs or any element, any nodes in your DOM. And then and down here, so here's all my includes. So I, I didn't, yeah, so that's the, be and that's the beauty of having like boost. So apparently Twitter, Twitter boost, there's a CDN for Twitter bootstrap. And then since AngularJS is actually provided by Google, you, they're, they, you know, they're automatically part of the Ajax Google API. And then this is what the code looks like. So you basically write these controllers that that has very that's functionality that you actually bind to elements in the in the DOM, yeah. which is pretty cool. So yeah, so here is there's ng click create create a rule. So and that's it. So that's all I have. And so yeah, so this is uh, this you know, this project's actually out on Git uh, on uh, GitHub. There's no license on it, but I'll probably it'll probably be MIT. So that's it. Any questions? No. No. Have you considered um, having the option to have like pre-flight rules so you wouldn't have to boot up the rail stack in order to do a, uh, a four hundred four? Yes, I, th I thought about that. Uh, I think in this case it was um, initially I wanted to build it as a as a cascade, and uh, if if you know what like. Uh, um, Rack has a has a, a middleware has an app called Cascade, which you can actually add a list of different apps to it, and it'll actually go through each one until it gets to 404. But that doesn't work because you can't actually. What I want to do is capture the 404 and the 404 response coming from the main app, so I can serve the 404 I want that I want. And that and that that, that becomes a problem if you try to do any pre-flighting, because then you can't. You have to you have to be responsible for rendering the 404 yourself, right? Whereas I can leave. I can let you know the Rails app. Return the 404 response, and I can I can render a, four, a nice a nicer 404 response instead of having to duplicate that code. I guess you could pre-flight it only if, and have like special special rules that we're only doing redirects, and then you yeah you know you can yeah. have header redirect. Yeah, you're, you're right. I mean, actually, um, the rack rewrite uh, uh, middleware that I'm using actually has a lot more has can do a lot more than just redirects, like three three hundred redirects. It can actually do. Uh, URL, uh, you know, path rewriting and all that stuff, like like uh, you know, like mod rewrite in Apache or Nginx, um, and you, it would be nice. But the 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 issue being that is that I don't want to hit the date. I don't want to have to hit that Redis server on every request. So uh, in the future, you, it would be interesting to basically come out with an intelligent cache to 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 uh, handle that. Anything else? That's it. Thank you.